my introduction to uh, a different kind of psychology was brought to me by uh, a man named Abraham Maslow back in uh, 1962. And, <clears throat> and I was fortunate enough to be able to study with, uh, with Dr. Maslow. And, and he really introduced me to a, uh, a different way of, uh, of looking at how to help people and how to improve the quality of our own lives. It was a turning point for me. And one of the things he spoke about uh, were these people that he calls self-actualizing people, which if you remember Maslow's pyramid and the hierarchy and you go from your basic needs to the very top of the pyramid, the very top of the pyramid is uh, something called self-actualization. And he described um, self-actualizing people, one of the flaws of self-actualizing people is that, they, uh, is that they get over death almost as if it didn't happen. Um, they have an awareness within them that, um, that nothing dies, that everything that um, materializes, of course, changes form. But um, there is something, my teacher in India, his name was uh, Swami Muktananda, many of you have read, and um, he was asked the question, what is real, Master, what is real? And Muktananda said, that is real, which never changes. Everything else is illusion. So I've been looking at, um, I've been thinking about Muktananda and uh, and thinking about Dr. Maslow, who uh, passed away on the 7th of June, 1970. And that was the same day that I was walking across the stage in Detroit at Cobo Hall, receiving my PhD, um, in almost the same hour. It was as if he had said to me, I've explained this whole idea of self-actualization to uh, the academic world. Now you explain it to the cab drivers <laughs> and the school teachers and the nurses and the yoga students and everyone else. This whole idea that there is, uh, that there is a higher place where each of us can reach right here while we're here. And um, I look at that pictures and I say, which one of them is my mother? <laughs> was she that 10-year-old? Um, according to Muktananda, that is real, which never changes. And all of us are here in bodies that we believe is who we are. We're totally convinced of it. I was in a 21-year-old body, and I can't find any part of it anywhere on the planet. <laughs> but while I was in it, I was absolutely convinced that this is who I am. And, and then I moved into another body, and another body, and another body. And the same is true for each and every one of us here, that there is some part of us that is infinite, that is the soul, that is the spirit. It most, makes no difference what you call it, um, many of you know that I wrote a book um, about seven years ago after living the uh, Tao Te Ching for a full year. It's called Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. The Tao Te Ching, some call it the wisest book ever written. Someone once sent me a copy of a book called uh, Jesus and Lao Tzu. And on the left-hand side of the page were all the sayings of Lao Tzu. And on the right-hand side of the page were all the sayings of Jesus that mirrored what Lao Tzu had said 500 years before his birth. Now, I'm not saying Jesus was plagiarizing, <laughs> but I am saying there are eternal truths. And these eternal truths came to me directly out of the Tao. And I did this for each of the 81 verses of the Tao. And the opening line of the Tao Te Ching 
says, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. As soon as you try to define this invisibleness that is within each and every one of us, that keeps occupying these new bodies all the time, while the body continues to change, who we are is infinite. So I wrote a few words out about what I think of as the soul. Let me just share them with you. The ideal of the soul, this part of you that is um, never changing, this part of you that is infinite. And that word infinite is a very important word to think about because um, it's the opposite of finite. Finite means something begins and ends. If it didn't end any place or didn't begin any place, we wouldn't be able to call it finite. We would say it is always continuing. The minute that it stops, the minute we have a form to it, the minute we place anything on it that, uh, that is associated with this physical corporeal world that we all live in, um, it moves from the infinite to the finite. So to try to define that which is infinite with a brain or a mind that is finite is an impossibility. Lao Tzu knew this and understood this. It's why meditation is such an important part of the uh, process of, uh, of coming to our highest self, coming to know who we are. It's the place where there are no beginnings. Herman Melville once said that, God's one and only voice is silence, is silence. It's the one place where there's nothing finite there. And Blaise Pascal, the famous uh, French philosopher and scientist, once said that uh, all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. But most of us just aren't comfortable with this because we have come to believe and trust in the evidence for who we are is on the basis of that which we can touch and see and feel and smell what our five senses tell us. But our five senses lie to us. William Blake pointed that out beautifully in one of his poems back in 1777. <laughs> He said, to see the world in a grain of sand, in a heaven in a wild flower, to hold eternity in the palm of your hand, and infinity in an hour, we are all led to believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye, which was born in a night to perish in a night while the soul slept in beams of light. We are all infinite beings in a temporary human experience. I've said it over and over again whenever people ask me what's my very favorite quote, my very favorite observation. It came from Pierre Tellard, the French priest who was excommunicated from the Catholic Church for his outrageous ideas. He said that we're not here as human beings having a spiritual experience. It's the other way around. We are all infinite spiritual beings having a temporary human experience. And coming to a place where we live our lives from that infinite place and beginning to know our soul so getting to know this, the soul, the spirit, and not identifying ourselves on the basis of our, our physical senses. It's the essence of my newest book, um, which is a PBS special, called Wishes Fulfilled. It's the whole message behind all of it, is to really come up with a specific way to, um, to come in contact with this 
infinite part of ourselves. Now remember, if it's infinite, it doesn't stop any place. It doesn't start any place. That's by definition infinite. So if something doesn't start and doesn't stop, what is it doing? It has to be expanding, doesn't it? The minute it stops expanding, it's finite. We're no longer talking about the soul. We're talking about what Blake said, we've become, we, we see with, not through our eyes. So here's what I jotted down. The ideal of the soul, the thing that it asks for, is neither knowledge, nor light, nor happiness. The ideal of the soul is space, immensity. The one thing it needs, more than anything else, is to be free to expand and to reach out and to embrace the infinite. Yet the ideal of the soul is infinity because that's what the soul is. We hope you enjoyed this great video. Don't forget to like and subscribe.